刻むでハモンのビート Welcome back to another installment of Debunking Iraqi Forgot, where I go back and answer JoJo fans' questions that I haven't already covered. It's been a little while now, so I think I've been able to put together a nicely sized list this time. The first topic is related to Cars in Part 2. I've seen some people say that Cars' attitude towards nature was inconsistent. First, we see Cars doing selfless acts like stopping the drunk drivers from hitting the dog and avoiding landing on a flower when he's falling. People say this is contradicted by how he acts after becoming the ultimate being, when he creates a squirrel and allows it to kill another squirrel. But while some people may say this is a contradiction, I would actually say this is the entire point of the character. Cars, in some ways, is not a completely evil person, and while he did horrible things, he did have an odd appreciation for nature and originally wanted to elevate his people above what he thought was their weakness. But the other Pillar Men knew the dangers from that since they would eventually end up consuming all life on Earth, destroying the nature that Cars was seen protecting. Once Cars did get his dream and became the ultimate being, it circles right back around to him betraying his principles and no longer caring about nature. It's like how they say absolute power corrupts absolutely. Even good people are not free from the influence power has over them. A perfect example to match this would be what happened to Will Zeppeli's father. Even though he was a good man before, the power of the mask compelled him to murder 50 people and even try to kill his own son. For Cars, it's the same. His desire to become the ultimate being corrupted him and erased even the small amount of good that he had. For the next topic, this person asks how Smokey was able to say he knew Joseph for six months, when the story of Part 2 only takes place across 30 days. This is a misconception. The place where this person got that figure was most likely from Wamu and SEDC's Wedding Rings of Death, which were said to dissolve into poison within 30 days. However, that only accounts for the time from when the rings were inserted to the battle with Wamu. The story had actually been going on for quite a while already before that started. According to Smokey's narration in the first chapter, he met Joseph in fall of 1938. At Joseph's funeral, we can see that it's 1939, meaning months had definitely already passed while Joseph knew Smokey, subtracting the two weeks between Cars' defeat and the funeral. There was also plenty of room for time to pass in the story. Joseph took the lengthy trip from New York to Mexico by motorcycle and then later traveled to meet Caesar. The JoJo 6251 art book also goes into some exact dates in the timeline. This same person had another question. They ask how Stroheim gave Joseph his metal hand if, according to the narration, they never saw each other again. But I think it should be pretty obvious that the narration is saying they never met again after their last meeting. According to Joseph, he got the hand from Stroheim, but may not see him again for a while because of the war. He ended up being right, and that's the last time that they met. The next question asks why Joseph didn't use Hermit Purple to read the minds of Enya or Darby to learn about Dio's ability. In case you've forgotten, Hermit Purple is actually capable of reading minds. According to Undul, he killed himself to prevent this from happening and inconveniencing Dio. As for Enya, they actually do address this. Joseph says that he is planning on reading her mind and just needs a TV to project her thoughts into. Once they reach the next town, though, she was killed by Steely Dan. As for Darby, who was also confirmed to have knowledge of Dio's stand, he was driven insane by his loss and wouldn't be of much use after that. Next is a question I've seen from all over the internet, which asks where Dio got the knives that he used against Jotaro. I'm surprised this is such a common question since it's pretty easy to answer. Dio himself says that he grabbed them from the shop that Jotaro launched him into. The next question involves part 4. This person asks why they didn't just check the records Aya might have in her shop of her patients so they can track down where Kozaku Kawajiri lives. However, this doesn't really make any sense. Kawajiri wasn't a patient of Aya's, he was a random bystander with a similar build that Kira dragged off the street, so there wouldn't be any record of him having been at the salon. One question I've seen a lot asks why Rohan didn't use Heaven's Door to find out if Mikitaka was really an alien or not. Now, the first and most obvious answer to this is that Rohan never really encountered Mikitaka enough in Part 4 to even know that he claimed to be an alien. The closest he came to really interacting with him was, of course, at the dice game, where he never really knew he was there at all. They were also both present for the ending, although they never exchange any dialogue or really interact whatsoever. 
What people are most likely thinking of here is an episode of the Thus Spoke Shibe Rohan OVA, adapting the chapter Mutsukabe Hill. Here a scene is shown of Rohan asking Mikitaka if he's really an alien, after which he starts explaining his story to him. Of course, this scene is something new that only exists in the anime adaptation. In the original manga, there is no such scene, and Mikitaka has yet to appear in any Thus Spoke Shibe Rohan chapters. Although even if we did consider this scene to be canon, it only shows the beginning of Mikitaka's explanation to Rohan, and cuts off before the conversation goes anywhere. So it's very possible that Rohan used Heaven's Door to learn the truth, it's just never shown on screen. Next is a comment I got in response to my Debunking Araki Forgot Part 4 video. In that video, I answered a question about why Yuya Fungami didn't help track down Kira with his ability, when he was able to track Koichi before. There I mentioned that there wasn't much of a window for them to actually do this, since Rohan discovered the potential identity of Kira almost immediately after Fungami became an ally. The comment says this isn't correct, since there could be plenty of time between episodes that isn't shown, leaving ample room for this to happen. What this comment doesn't seem to know is that the timeline of Part 4's events is laid out very clearly. According to the manga, Shigechi's death happened on June 24th, Later, when Kira had taken Kozaku's identity, it was said to be July 1st. A little while later, Fungami is introduced. What you may remember from watching the anime is how all these final arcs cross over. Rohan's encounter with Cheap Trick was happening simultaneously with the fight at the Transmission Tower and then the Enigma fight that first made Fungami into an ally. Kira was finally defeated on July 16th, so even if you're being really generous, there's barely any time at all for this idea to happen. For the next topic, one question says that after Shigechi died, all the stand users of Moria were able to feel that it had happened and met up. But later, when Rohan was killed by Bites the Dust, the other characters nearby didn't feel anything. This one's a real doozy since that first part about them feeling Shigechi's death is completely made up. At no point does anyone say that they can sense that Shigechi died. What actually happened here was Josuke got all of the stand users together and brought a picture of Shigechi to Raimi to confirm that he had died. The fact that he even had to confirm this with her pretty much dispels the idea of them sensing it. There have been times in the JoJo series where characters will sense the deaths or injuries of another. This happened in Part 3 when Enya felt the injuries of Jay Guile. However, this only happened because they shared a psychic link, something that Shigechi did not have with any of the other characters. Next is a comment I got asking about Star Platinum's strength. It says that even though Star Platinum is supposed to be extremely physically strong, it still struggles against people it should easily beat. As an example, he brings up Kira, and says that even though Kira was untrained, he was somehow fast enough to block Star Platinum's punches. However, this is not what happened at all. Jotaro absolutely curb-stomped Kira when they fought. The only reason Kira wasn't completely defeated here was because of Jotaro's injuries from sheer heart attack making him pass out. Next, this comment says that Kira's father shouldn't have been able to tell him about the ghost alley, since only stand users can enter the alley, and stands didn't start appearing in Morio until after Keicho got the arrow, this should be impossible. However, this comment has a really bad understanding of when stand users started appearing. Keicho and his arrow have absolutely nothing to do with Kira or his father. Yoshihiro Kira had his own arrow that he received from Enya years ago. This is the arrow that Awakens stands in him and his son, and it's the whole reason Kira was able to get away with murders for so long. So that's plenty of time for Yoshihiro to have learned about the ghost alley and informed his son. The next comment has to do with the spin-off manga Crazy Diamond's Demonic Heartbreak. While this story isn't written by Araki, I do think this was a funny enough topic to include. If you don't already know it, this manga is set shortly before Part 4 and involves Whole Horse and Boingo traveling to Morio where they meet Josuke. I got a comment, however, that says its status as a prequel doesn't make any sense since it was said in Part 4 that Crazy Diamond didn't have a name until Jotaro gave it one, and that furthermore, his stand didn't even have a full physical form other than an arm until he and Jotaro met. First of all, let me just get the name one out of the way. Unlike what this comment assumes, the manga doesn't conflict with this at all. They don't refer to Crazy Diamond by name since it doesn't have one yet. Even the marketing from before the manga started says that the story takes place before it was named. And second, this whole arm thing. This idea is also completely made up and I have no idea where they could have gotten it from. 
There is simply no dialogue or any kind of information that suggests Crazy Diamond was only an arm before the story began. The next comment says that it was stated that all members of Pashone are stand users, but for some reason Leaky Eye Luca didn't have one. This seems to be a really common misconception since I've been seeing comments like this for years. However, the answer is quite clear. It was never stated at any point that all members of Pashone have stands. Perhaps they're referring to the fact that Pulpo's test involves a stand arrow that likely awoke stands in many of the members. However, that test was done to let people work under Pulpo, like Bucciarati's team was. There are many different factions of Pashone with likely many ways of joining. Even high-ranking members like the Capo Pericolo were shown to not have access to a stand ability. What some people are likely thinking of is the statement that all of La Squadra were stand users. However, as I said before, it was never suggested that this applies to all of Pashone. One comment has to do with the fight against Black Sabbath in Part 5. It asks why the stand didn't just teleport into Giorno and Koichi's shadows to attack them. However, this is not how the stand works at all. It doesn't teleport, and it certainly couldn't move to a shadow that's by itself. Giorno or Koichi's shadows would have to touch a shadow that it has access to in order for it to enter them. We see this later when Black Sabbath takes advantage of a bird flying overhead to move with its shadow to come closer to them. The next topic has to do with the fight against Clash and Talking Head in Part 5. Before I've answered a common question as to why Narancha couldn't just say the opposite of what he wanted so that the truth would come out. This is because Talking Head doesn't make you say the opposite of what you want to say, it makes you lie. If you were to purposefully lie while under the effects of Talking Head, nothing would happen and the lie would just come out normally. However, someone responded to this by saying that Narancha actually did do this, when he tricked the enemies by saying the opposite of what he meant and allowing Talking Head to reverse it. This isn't what happened at all, though. In this scene, Narancha purposefully says out loud that Squalo got away. However, this was a lie. He actually hadn't got away, and Narancha only said this to trick him into thinking he was safe. Just like I said before, he said a lie on purpose, and it came out as a lie, not as the truth. Next, this comment asks how Chocolata suddenly got his arm back during Giorno's beatdown, when moments before it was away holding Mista hostage. This is another easy one since, as we can see, at no point does he actually get his arm back. It's missing for the entirety of the scene. What this person may be thinking of is the anime, which does make the error of having his arm suddenly reappear. Next, I got a comment asking how Versus was able to take Weather's memory disc from Poochie, when this is just a memory of the disc and not the real one. However, this is not what happened at all. First, Versus looked at a memory of Poochie from a short time earlier. The memory is a perfect recreation of him, so it showed that the disc was in his pocket. Versus read the contents of the disc and realized why Poochie was hiding it. So later, he took the disc from Poochie himself and sent it away to Weather. As Pucci explains, he grabbed the real disc when he was being launched away by Jolene. I got another person commenting that talks about the moment right after Weather gets back his memory. They ask why Weather mentions that he's going by Weather Report now, when later we see in the flashback that people always called him Weather. While it is true that in the past Wes was called Weather as a nickname, he was not called the full name Weather Report. He wasn't called that until after he lost his memory, which is what he's referring to here. Next is a question I've been seeing a lot lately. I would say that since the release of the Part 6 anime, this is the biggest topic to be asked about. Some people are confused as to how Poochie was able to move and see inside of Jotaro's time stop shortly before he got made in heaven. The reason he can do this is because by having Sea Moon and reaching the coordinates laid out in the plan, Poochie had complete control over gravity. According to the Made in Heaven stat page, gravity and time are linked together, so having complete control over gravity would give you control over time. Hence why Poochie was now able to move in Time Stop and why his stand evolved into a time-related one. The next comment asks about the final battle of Part 6. It says that since Diver Down was inside all of the characters to take damage for them, Jotaro shouldn't have been worried about the knives hitting Jolene, since they would just hit Diver Down instead. However, this is ignoring the fact that Anasui was just killed after Poochie stabbed him with Stonefree's arm. Since he's dead, the stand would no longer be active to protect Jolene. Next, I've gotten a few different comments asking how Emporio was able to make Poochie insert the Weather Report disc, when at this point Poochie no longer has access to Whitesnake. 
However, at no point was it ever necessary to use Whitesnake to insert a disc. We saw before then many characters were able to insert and read discs, and of course Jotaro had both discs inserted into him to save his life. So Poochie would not need Whitesnake to do this at all. Perhaps some people are confused as to why Poochie had to be the one to do it, and then assumed his stand must be involved. However, Whitesnake itself has nothing to do with that. As I've explained in other videos, Poochie was the only one in the new universe not controlled by fate. So to make a large change in fate like inserting the disc, Emporio needed Poochie to be the one to do it. This next comment asks how it's possible that Polnareff could find the Beetle Arrow if in the new universe Poochie no longer exists. I honestly have no clue what could lead someone to think that these things have anything to do with each other. According to the comment, Poochie would never be able to travel to Egypt to leave the arrow there for Polnareff to find. Of course, this doesn't make any sense, since Dio was the one to bring the arrow to America from Egypt in the first place. Next, they say that if it weren't for Poochie leaving the arrow in a village, Polnareff wouldn't have been able to find it like we saw in Part 5. This also makes no sense, since the scene being described is from years later after Polnareff was crippled by Diavolo, when he's hiding out in an Italian farmhouse. In that scene, he explicitly mentions that the arrow displayed on the wall is one that he had previously discovered in Egypt, where it would be anyway whether Pucci received it or not. Finally, the commenter doesn't seem to remember Dio being involved in this at all, and wonders how Polnareff could have possibly found the arrow in Egypt if Pucci hadn't left it there. Of course, what actually happened was that Polnareff found this arrow in the 1990s when he and Jotaro investigated them by traveling to Dio's mansion in Egypt. Another comment I've gotten asks how Thus Spoke Shube Rohan is canon when its placement in the timeline conflicts with the ending of Part 6. The comment says that the chapter Hot Summer Martha takes place in 2021, while in Part 6, the universe ended in 2012, making this impossible. However, this comment seems to forget that at the end of Part 6, time continues in the new universe beyond 2012. This is connected to a bigger misunderstanding in the JoJo community when it comes to Part 6's ending. Some believe that all the people in the world were reborn into radically different lives as new people, much like the souls of the Part 6 main cast were at the end. However, this is not the case. After Emporio defeated Pucci, the timeline was reset a final time. As Emporio mentioned, he was fated to defeat Pucci since he and the others were walking the path of justice. This is an idea also mentioned by Giorno at the end of Part 5. Fate rewards people who are just, and punishes people who are evil and try to tamper with fate. Diavolo repeatedly avoided his fate by skipping time, but it all eventually backfired by leading to Giorno gaining Gold Experience Requiem to punish him. The same is true in Part 6. After Pucci tampered with fate by creating the new universe, fate self-corrected and rewarded the main characters in the new timeline so their souls were reborn into better lives. When it comes to the rest of the world, though, they'd remain mostly the same. People like Rohan wouldn't be changed, which is why in the recent Rohan chapter set in the 2020s, he's the same Rohan we always knew. He and everyone else from the previous universe just now exist in the same universe as the reborn Part 6 characters. I've gotten some comments asking why after Johnny got Tusk Act 3, that he continues using Act 2 most of the time. Some have even claimed that other than its first appearance, Act 3 was not used ever again. First of all, Act 3 still saw plenty of use after its first appearance, so that second part is just wrong. But what I think people are not understanding here is that Act 3 is not just an upgrade of Act 2 that makes it obsolete. Act 3 has a very specific, situational power that allows Johnny to enter his bullet holes. The only time it would be used is if Johnny wants to do that specific thing, and not just while he's normally shooting, which is what Act 2 is for. For Part 8, I've gotten a lot of comments asking how Kira was with the girl in his apartment as seen in the photo album, when at that point he had already fallen into the walleyes and become Josuke. However, people seem to be missing that Ojiro directly answers this question. These pictures aren't of Kira, but of Ojiro dressed up as Kira, which he did to frame him and make the woman believe that he was the one responsible. The next question involves the Johnny flashback from early in Jojolian. This comment asks how Johnny was able to use the golden rotation to remove the curse when he isn't on a horse. Well, as I'm sure you've already noticed from watching the video, he is on a horse. The next comment asks, 
How did the Rokakaka smuggling organization figure out the branches Josefumi grafted onto their tree were fake? This is also a simple question since Damo addresses this directly. He says that they noticed the tree had gotten heavier. At first they didn't think anything of it, since normally you'd only be suspicious if the tree had gotten lighter. However, the trick was revealed when the tree wilted away without bearing any fruit, which tipped them off to the fact that the actual branches had been stolen. Next, I've gotten a few comments asking about the fusion between Soft and Wet and Killer Queen done by the Walleyes. After the two stands fused, Soft and Wet gained some of Killer Queen's power. Well, if we look back at White Snake, after it fused with the Green Baby, it became an entirely new stand. Now, I'm kind of disappointed that I even have to point out how these two situations are not in any way comparable. The creation of Sea Moon was a very specific process that involved inheriting Dio's will to create heaven from the Green Baby to cause the stand to undergo a transformation, while Josuke's Soft and Wet was created through the powers of equivalent exchange from the Walleyes and Fruit. The two processes couldn't be any more different. Another comment asks how Josuke got rid of the effects of the Lokakaka 6251. At first he had rocks embedded into his face, but they eventually disappeared. This is actually just part of the effects of the serum itself. 6251 was a perfected version of the Rokakaka made for medicinal use. So instead of just immediately turning a piece of the body into stone, it makes the exchanged parts appear externally where they can crumble away. This happened after Josuke jumped into the water to get rid of the rock insect. The rocks on his face simply washed off. This last question deals with a moment from the final chapter. They ask how it's possible that Daya is looking at the cake with a magnifying glass, when as we already know, Daya is blind. However, this isn't really the case, and Daya is actually not completely blind. As we saw in the Vitamin C arc, she can just barely see things if she holds them close to her face. So with the magnifying glass, she may be able to see the cake as well. That's all the Iraqi Forgot topics for this video. Once I collect some more topics, I'll definitely make another, so feel free to comment with them or reply to the pinned comment underneath the video. I will ask, however, that you do not reply to other people with multiple messages in that thread, since it'll max out the reply limit. If you want to be updated on new videos and announcements, you can join the Haman Beat Discord using the link in the description. To receive rewards like Discord perks, uncut videos, and the opportunity to submit questions, you can support the channel on Patreon. This video's patron question comes from Seth. He asks which JoJo light novel I would like to see animated by David Production. Now I actually haven't read all of the light novels yet, but I would say that I'd like to see Purple Haze Feedback animated the most. I really enjoy its new characters and I think some of the fights would be really amazing to see in motion. It's also written by Kohei Kodono, who is writing Crazy Diamond's Demonic Heartbreak, another spin-off that I really enjoy. So that novel would definitely be my first pick. Thank you for watching. This is the part of the video where I thank my $5 and up patrons. Thank you to Alex Ramirez, Doorbell, Crayon, Rigo Vids, Zucato, Pumpkin Doge, Marrow, Almighty Quarth, Oof, Cowrie, Halil, Gatlin Grove, Lime Jinjo, 17 Hit Combo, Phantom Kai, Sponge Cake, Kakext, Feliciano Rabaja, Rayana Meme, Christian McDonough, Navi, Reed Gobianjo Jolian on AO3, Emmanuel Etienne, Pulse Dog, and Great Riek.